you everyone for joining us. It's so wonderful to see so many boxes yet today. Um, hopefully we'll see some faces a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to uh, our Nishla president, Katie Hunter, for her to introduce our um, lecture for the end of the year series. So I'll give it to you, Katie. All right. Thank you, Dr. Walsh Aziz. Um, as she said, my name's Katie and I'm the current chapter president of NISHLA, which if you didn't know, stands for the student or the National Student Speech Language and Hearing Association. Uh, before we begin our annual Catherine Curran lecture, I'm proud to announce that we have a new set of board members. Please uh, help me congratulate our president, Stephanie Perez, Vice President Audrey Hart, Secretary Jackie Valenzuela, our Treasurer Vesta Atacora, and our Kesha Liaison, Ida Cordoza. Congratulations, everybody. All right, now our speaker for this evening is a teacher in the Denver Public Schools, an advocate for social justice, and a personal friend. Here to talk about cultural sustainability, please welcome Enrique Smith-Cruz. Enrique? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, congratulations, first of all, uh, to our recent graduates. I know MSU just uh, did their graduations recently. So excellent work, all of you. I know you worked hard um, and you're done, right? There's no more school after this. You don't have to do any. Um, just uh, just graduate school, I'm sure. Um, I have a Pear Deck prepared. Uh, if you haven't used this tool before, it's kind of like an interactive presentation format. Um, and I'll, I'll be asking the occasional question for you to participate. We can get some answers. Uh, one really excellent um, part of Paradeck is that it is anonymous, so you don't have to feel the pressure of saying like, oh my gosh, I'm worried about saying this or that. Um, so I encourage you to share whatever you feel or whatever you think. Um, there are no quote unquote long answers, so to speak. Uh, so I'll give you just a, a minute or two to join us in the Pear Deck. And uh, we'll get uh, we'll get this ball rolling. This is my first time using Microsoft Teams, so please let me know if there is an issue with my voice, or um, I don't think the camera is on or working, but that's okay. Um, if you can just let me know so that I can address that. You can also uh, text me in the chat. I am able to um, see the chat. If you have any questions that pop up, use that as a parking lot. Um, I'm not super great at lecturing. I do like a more interactive uh, kind of format. Okay, um, I'll leave that link up. You are able to join at any point uh, from this part on. Um, just type in the letters that appear in the upper right hand corner of the screen uh, if you'd like to join us in the Pear Deck. Again, I am able to read your comments in the chat as well. Um, so uh, part of uh, who I am is uh, I want to help other people build culturally sustaining relationships. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Enrique Smith Cruz. And uh, one of my goals is to build a culture within my profession that is equitable, just, and culturally sustaining. Um, I currently have ties with uh, the Denver Public School District, Aurora Public Schools, and uh, the University of Colorado, Denver, UCD. Um, and we try to work together to build programs, right? Uh, to build programs that allow students to access schools um, and other resources more effectively. Um, I have spent the last few years in public education um, and I've been building my practice and this is the area I've decided to focus in. Um, my teaching focus, I teach uh, physics and uh, AP physics currently and I am crossing my fingers to get approved for an introduction to engineering course uh, at the high school level. Uh, if you're wondering uh, physics, that sounds very familiar. That would be the class that you took where you're like, hey, wasn't this a class about car crashes and catapults? Uh, but you were tricked. It was just math. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, I went to high school in Florida. 
and then I completed my bachelor's degree in behavioral psychology at FIU. Uh, when I graduated from high school, um, I, I had initially wanted to be a teacher really badly, uh, but I got tonked out of it because of my mother. Um, she said, uh, Mijo, you're not going to make any money doing that. You're going to be poor, all these things. And uh, joke was on her. I ended up being poor anyway. So um, I went into the psychology industry, um, and that wasn't quite the right fit for me, although I did learn a lot about um, kind of forging relationships with clients. Um, I began my career as a Colorado teacher just a few years ago, and I graduated with my master's degree in um, science education for urban and culturally diverse populations. So um, I know that's quite a handful. I'm hoping that they will give us a, a nice nickname like uh, you guys have at NSS LHA. Um, but so far, that's what I'm stuck with. So let's um, talk. This summer, we, um, a lot of us had our, our eyes open. We started a, a national conversation. And for a lot of people, was, uh, the events of last summer, starting um, with the death of George Floyd, um, kind of opened up our minds to the idea that maybe the world isn't exactly as we thought it would be. Um, this conversation has been difficult for a lot of people, and in no small part, it has been difficult for people of color like myself. Um, these are truisms that we've, that we, uh, my community, uh, I'm Afro-Caribbean, have known for a very long time. Um, talks that I've had with my mother, who is very dark-skinned, um, that have been very difficult for us, and now we're opening that up to uh, the rest of the world. So with this talk, I would like to focus on a problem that we have within the professions. Um, I've looked into a little bit about audiology, I'll be, I'll admit I'm not an expert uh, in your field, obviously, um, but the things that I've learned and the things I'm about to share with you can be applied broadly because we see similar trends across the professions, across professionals. So the first step to kind of addressing any issues with a practice is to size up the problem. This is a quote from Bettina Love. She writes an essay uh, regarding how her schooling was lacking growing up as a uh, young black woman in the United States. My K through 12, Schooling was filled with white teachers who at their core were good people, but were unknowingly murdering my spirit with their lack of knowledge, care, and love for my culture. So let's take a look around. Um, you've been uh, taking these courses for some time. You're a part of this club. Um, let's take a look. What types of people do we tend to see in your profession. I'll be sharing those answers in just a moment, um, but please share them in the Pear Deck. What types of people do we tend to see in your profession? Uh, personalities, race, gender, um, religion maybe might be a factor we consider. So what types of people do we tend to see in your profession? Okay, so let's see. We see a lot of a lot of women. 
Um, a lot of extroverted people, uh, predominantly female, um, and higher socioeconomic so uh, um, status, perhaps. Um, top talkative, empathetic. I think uh, if you go into any profession where the the job is to help someone, to help them achieve a goal, help them uh, improve their quality of life. Uh, I think empathy is probably one of the biggest, um, biggest qualities that you might have. Um, maybe analytical. Let's see, high achieving personalities. Yeah, definitely. Um, in my profession as well, you tend to see a lot of um, type A's uh, in the old nomenclature. Um, a lot of type A personalities, people who really, really want to try their best, do their best, uh, like to be in control. Um, and the majority of clinicians um, identify as white and uh, female. Um, so if we uh, take a look at uh, some of the demographics that uh, Ms. Hunter kindly shared with me, um, ASHA's SLP members have a demo issue. It is 96% uh, female um, and 92% white. That is, uh, that is the statistic for it. Um, and uh, you find that this is something that holds true in, um, in almost every, uh, every profession that requires a bachelor's or higher degree. Um, for example, um, as a teacher, um, most of my colleagues are also female. Most of them are also white. Uh, so you can see how my job uh, suddenly becomes a lot more uh, impactful uh, and my voice uh, suddenly becomes uh, a little bit rarer. So uh, this is an issue endemic, not just to um, uh, SLPs, of course. Uh, this is an issue endemic to oops, Oh, hold on, I'm having an issue here. There we go. Um, issue endemic to physicians, right? Uh, over half of them are white. Um, and uh, the majority are male. About 65% of physicians are male. Uh, lawyers, 85% um, of lawyers uh, tend to be white. And a uh, pretty even split between black and Latino uh, lawyers. Uh, persons who identify as um, Asians tend to kind of vary quite a lot, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, teachers, again, uh, very white in, in Denver, um, where I, I tend to work, <laughs> uh, it's actually closer to 90% white, uh, with relatively few Black and Latino uh, teachers, as well as very few Asian Pacific Island uh, teachers. And then uh, we look at some of the other uh, professions like accountants, and this trend continues. Uh, we see this, this trend of overwhelmingly white, um, or at least majority white, and relatively little representation for black and brown people. Um, and again, Asians, they tend to vary, uh, Asian and Pacific Islanders tend to vary a little bit uh, across the professions, uh, mostly due to uh, American immigration policies and uh, other things outside of the um, locuses that we typically consider. So why so white? Why are the professions so white? Um, this is a question that I think people don't tend to ask unless someone brings it up. Um, historically, uh, racism is baked into the culture of the United States at many levels, and acknowledging that shared history of racial discrimination is very difficult. It's very difficult for many. Um, many institutions are, have been historically white, including physicians, um, law offices, uh, and education have been historically white, and those persons who are um, non-whites uh, tend to be excluded and um, marginalized. So, for example, you might hear the phrasing, um, a bank versus a black bank or a business versus a black business. Um, we also see systemic discrimination, um, which is discrimination that is, results from systems, which though not established expressly to exclude minoritized groups, nonetheless have an exaggerated impact on these communities. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think when people think of, uh, of, of racism, especially um, perhaps people who are not in the education industry, 
Uh, they tend to think of uh, of racism as a uh, as a uh, snidely whiplash, twisting his mustache, and and uh, you know denying denying uh, POC rights. But that's not the case. Often it occurs through inaction um, or through actions which inadvertently affect uh, people of color more. Um, have a greater impact on these people of color. We see um, with COVID, um, the pandemic has largely impacted communities of color, far more so um, than other communities. And then of course, economic, I think uh, you, you have grasped onto that based on your responses, on some of your responses. Accessibility to the professions is largely limited by socioeconomic status. Um, in order to become uh, almost any type of teacher, you need an extensive education period, which requires, of course, a great deal of money, um, as well as uh, you don't just get to graduate and go to work in a lot of cases. Uh, you have to perform your internships and work uh, fellowships and all sorts of low paying positions uh, or perhaps even uh, non paid positions. And you can see uh, suddenly we have people of color who have uh, a much lower socioeconomic status, uh, typically, end up unable to compete, right? They're unable to go to school for the 12 years you need to go to school to be a doctor or to achieve a doctorate. Uh, they're unable to complete that two-year residency, that two-year internship. Um, and then, of course, uh, race uh, is what I'll be focusing on today, but that is not uh, the only form of discrimination there is. I am talking to, uh, I am a, a male, uh, speaking to a group of women, um, and I would not dare uh, Dean to say uh, I, I fully understand the female experience, um, and I do acknowledge that I have some privilege uh, based on my gender, uh, based on my sex. So we find that discrimination issues are compounded by race and gender and culture and religion um, and a half a dozen other things that make up the individual. And we call this interplay intersectionality. So consider for a moment, I, I only listed race, gender, um, and culture, uh, but what are some other uh, factors which would certainly contribute to a person's identity? Um, I'll give you a moment to respond and then I'll share out some of these answers. Um, so religion is a big one. Uh, disability. I was hoping someone would say disability. Yes, um, disability is hugely impactful on a person's identity, um, and even more so that that impact is compounded by race, gender, culture, um, family, social economic status. Um, and within your profession, you will largely be dealing with, and I don't want to step on anyone's toes or use the wrong nomenclature, um, but persons who uh, who want to, uh, who might identify as having a disability or identify as wanting to um, better fit into a larger, larger culture. So <clears throat> uh, the way a person dresses and acts, the way a person dresses and acts, um, I think this is one people don't consider. Um, we recently in Colorado uh, passed a law that is an anti 
Um, it's called the Crown Law. Uh, and they generally prevent discrimination based on traditional and culturally representative hairstyles. Um, it's it's not uncommon to hear someone say um, the, oh, you know, I expect the Yale, the players at Yale to be clean cut guys. What does clean cut mean? Um, ability, status, ableism, immigration status uh, in Colorado. Uh, the largest minority group by far are from Mexico. Um, so their immigration status suddenly matters a lot. I have dozens of students who come to me and they're concerned, they're very worried about their immigration status. Mister, what's gonna happen if this happens? What's gonna happen if that happens? Um, and it's very heartbreaking to me that I essentially don't have all the answers for them. I can just try to reassure them um, and make sure that they are um, that they are at least A little bit uh, less anxious. Um, career, definitely, yes. Uh, many people identify themselves uh, by their career and they judge others based on their career. Uh, careers have entire subcultures associated with them. Um, so when we're talking about a person's identity and we're talking about trying to be culturally sustaining, we want them to uh, not just feel like they are being helped, but also feel like they are a part of a community and that their input is valuable, we have to sort of keep a lot of things in mind, right? Um, <clears throat> nationality, language, all of, all of these things are factors which contribute to a person's identity. Very good. Um, let me head back over here. So let's take a look at some of the impact of um, discrimination, systemic discrimination within communities. Um, and you'll be hearing me use uh, certain language like minoritized or minority groups. Um, if you have any questions regarding the language, uh, please let me know and I'll be happy to explain further. So um, we of course know the economic impact. According to a 2016 study, uh, the median wage for households with a bachelor's degree among whites was $75,000 a year, among blacks and Latinos, considerably less at $65,000 a year. Um, we see that the intergenerational transfer of wealth between families, uh, white families and families of color uh, is very, very little. In fact, um, a black woman graduating with a bachelor's degree has less net value than a white person who does not graduate from high school, um, than a white man who doesn't graduate from high school. So the economic impacts can be pretty huge. And this is something that we have to consider uh, as we move forward and try to build our practices. Because I know that um, among this group of people, we have incredibly empathetic, incredibly loving people whose entire goal is to just help people, make sure people have access to what they want and what they need. Um, so considering the economic impact of systems of um, discrimination and oppression, um, the psychological impact, something that I think uh, gets glossed over a lot and you see it more, I think you see it more as a teacher than you do in almost any other profession because you interact with so many people and um, at this level students uh, and teenagers are very uh, sensitive and in a lot of ways I feel that they are um, more plainly affected uh, they, they haven't quite had it pushed down yet um, but a 2008 study in the Journal of Counseling Psychology found that race re uh, related stress was significantly more was a significantly more powerful risk factor than stressful life events for psychological distress. So we're talking about race-related events, things like discrimination, racism. Um, I got followed at the store uh, because they thought I'd be a shoplifter. I was embarrassed having to ask for the key for my black hair products. Um, race-related stress was a significantly more powerful risk factor than stressful life events like being fired from a job. Um, being disconnected from family, things of that nature. So this is a huge impact. Something we, we definitely want to and need to consider is what is the psychological impact of this person with whom I'm trying to build a relationship with? 
what is this person's state of mind? Uh, I recently uh, was watching uh, an episode of Survivor. Uh, I watched Survivor reruns, it's kind of one of my hobbies, and I try to analyze um, who's going to win by taking a look at the people at the beginning of the season versus the end of the season. And um, I was watching them at Tribal Council. Um, I was watching them at the Tribal Council event, and there was an altercation between two of the contestants. One of the contestants was white, the other was black. And um, the black contestant said that he felt that this dislike towards him was racialized. And I honestly believed the white contestant's uh, response that it was not racialized. It had nothing to do with race for him. But for the black contestant, his entire life, he has never known or it's been difficult for him to realize or to understand whether someone dislikes him because of who he is as a person, uh, just like you and I uh, dislike certain people, it's fine. Um, or if they are disliked or being impacted because of their race on a personal level. I have been, I've lost a handful of jobs in my lifetime um, and I've been denied opportunities and it's always in the back of my mind. Was I denied this opportunity um, because of my qualifications, which seems likely, or was I denied this opportunity because my name is Enrique, I speak Spanish, Spanish was my original first language. Uh, maybe, was I denied an opportunity because my mother is black, because I identify as Afro-Caribbean? And so while that's, probably not the case. I acknowledge that that's almost certainly not the case. There's always that psychology in the back of my mind, that niggling doubt um, that I'm sure a lot of you experience. Was I denied this because of who I am or because of what I've done? And that is an impact that cannot be understated. Am I not responding to this uh, intervention, to this treatment? because of who I am and, and where I come from and my culture and my background, or is it because uh, a, a personal failing, a failing on my behalf? And that kind of psychological impact has a huge echo throughout a person's um, life. So lastly, cultural impact. We inhabit cultural worlds. I don't think it's, any, it's a surprise to anyone uh, if I were to say we live in a society. Um, and culture shapes our perspective. Racialized contexts promote ways of seeing, being, and acting in the world. Um, you get treated like a monster long enough, you kind of turn into a monster, right? Uh, we see this in film uh, pretty frequently. It's a common theme uh, on dating back all the way back to the uh, 1800s with um, the original uh, Phantom of the Opera. Uh, play, or not play, uh, the, the novella. So we have to take a look at, as professionals, as people who want to help other people, who want to build our practice, we have to consider our own biases. And this is much harder, intuit the biases that a person might have about themselves. A person who identifies um, or who has internalized a disability, suddenly that becomes their whole world. A person who has internalized uh, discrimination and hatred, suddenly that becomes their whole world. It colors every interaction they, they come into contact with. Even absorbing it passively. Um, I think one of my least favorite phrases that I hear, or I, I hear it less now because I'm a little bit older, uh, but when I was in college I would, or, or uh, high school, I would hear this a lot. Um, and I sometimes hear it from my students and it's very bothersome. Uh, Mr. I don't like hanging out with other girls because uh, girls are just so dramatic. Uh, and to me that just screams internalized misogyny. Because anytime someone says that, my brain instantly goes, have you opened a history book? Um, I think men have caused plenty of drama in their time. So, um, we have to analyze these cultural impacts, these um, cultural worlds that we live in. What are the layers that we're dealing with when we're talking to a client, when we're talking to a student, when we're talking to a colleague? And of course, um, no talk 
uh, regarding cultural sustainability uh, and especially this kind of uh, cross content uh, communication would be complete without health outcomes. Disparities in health outcomes for minoritized groups have resulted in reduced quantity and quality of care. Um, if you may have noticed uh, with the recent vaccine rollouts, there was a lot of distrust for the vaccine. And a lot of that does fall on, um, on anti-vaxxers and, and that type of internet culture. But it mostly falls, uh, or not mostly, but it also partially falls on distrust of institutions from people of color. Uh, black and brown people are less likely to get the vaccine for COVID-19 because they have historically been mistreated by the uh, health care industry. And then of course, all of these health, comes, uh, health outcomes uh, result in lower life expectancy and quality of life for uh, persons of uh, various backgrounds. Up until recently, medical textbooks still included passages on how to treat uh, persons of various races with the kinds of things that would be completely wild uh, to even think about today, like black people have um, thicker skin than whites, or a uh, Asian, or a, I think it was something like a Hispanic person will um, reject treatment for fear of, of seeming weak. It's like, wait a minute, I'm, first of all, I'm Hispanic. I've never denied myself treatment because I didn't want to be seen as weak. Uh, when I've been to a hospital, I've always wanted that treatment. Uh, if I've ever felt badly enough to go to a hospital, if I've ever felt badly enough to go see a doctor, to go see a therapist, to go see a, a professional, I've never felt the need to say, well, hold on, is this going to make me look a little bit weaker in my culture? So we have this ingrained distrust of institutions, which results in all of these uh, health outcomes being poorer. So uh, all of you uh, have hopes and aspirations and dreams of, of going on to build your own practices within your profession. So what are some difficulties you think you might face building a practice within minoritized communities? What are some things that you think you might uh, struggle with going forward? Um, what are some inroads that you think might be difficult to make? Um, give you just another few seconds here to respond before I share out some of your replies. Ah, a tale as old as time, the language barrier. For as long as there's been humans who speak different languages, we've had an issue with language barriers. Um, and overcoming that barrier will be one of your responsibilities in your practice. Um, not knowing enough about culture or language. Um, that's important as well. And I'll be giving you a, a few strategies um, to address a gap in your knowledge about an individual's culture. Um, understanding their priorities, financial struggles. Hmm. This is the big one. Um, and financial struggles don't necessarily mean uh, paying for uh, the actual intervention uh, or the office visits, consultations, whatever else you might need. Uh, financial struggles could be as simple as I have enough to, to uh, pay for the office visit. I don't have enough 
to buy a car and get me to those office visits twice a week. Um, making it affordable. Uh, affordability is a huge issue for uh, people of color. Uh, it's a huge issue for for all Americans. The American healthcare system is famously inequitable. Um, and that extends to many different sectors uh, for for healthcare um, and treatment options. Uh, religious belief um, that is that is definitely something that you come across. Uh, it's something that I have I have had many long conversations into the night with parents about um, regarding uh, students' beliefs or family beliefs, cultural beliefs regarding God, body autonomy. Um, trouble understanding what they're going through or walking through their shoes. Um, we call that empathy, of course. Uh, sometimes that's going to be an issue. Uh, I would be, I would be a, a, a dirty, dirty liar if I were to tell you, you will always understand everyone's problems all the time. Um, it's impossible to do that. It's impossible for one person to do that. Um, and that's okay. Accessibility, good trust. Ooh, boy. So that's what this whole talk is about, is building those relationships. Building trust. Building trust. Having another person look you in the eye and say, I trust you to know and do what's best for me in this situation, in this scenario, in this aspect of my life. I am trusting you with my well-being. So I'm glad that this one kind of came up last because building trust is gonna be the key to building your profession, to building up your practice. Um, so, addressing the problem. We've identified the scope of the issue. We've identified the impacts on uh, communities of color. So how can we build our practices so that they're able to sustain all communities and not be exclusionary towards other people? Um, so I've got some really good news and I've got some bad news. I'll go with the bad news first. Let's get it out of the way. We'll rip the Band-Aid off. The bad news is we can't fix systemic inequality in an hour-long talk. Shock. Uh, unfortunately, that is beyond our scope and our ability to do. However, I have good news. The good news is you, you uh, newly minted uh, graduates and students who are still working towards your goal can have an individual impact starting today, right now, as a matter of fact, by internalizing uh, some of what I'm about to talk about right now. Uh, this is part of what my job is when I am speaking with my colleagues, uh, both at the uh, district level the uh, community level and at the university level. The action funnel. Um, this is a idea that I borrowed from uh, a colleague of mine back in university. Um, and this is a way, this is a technique, a, a way for you as you uh, continue your education and start to build your practice, build those connections, build those networks. This is a way for you to identify issues that you might have. <coughs> Excuse me. And work to address those. So uh, the first level of our action funnel is awareness. Most of you are already here. Uh, next step down, discovery. You've, become making your, uh, you've begun making your own inquiries and investigations. Um, Evaluation comes next, examine areas for improvement, intent, outline specific and actionable goals, implement your plan, implement your, your goals, and reevaluate. See what worked, revise, replan, re-implement. You work through this funnel. This funnel isn't something that you do the one time and you wipe your hands clean and you're done. I did it. I solved cultural sustainability. Um, this is a continuous cycle. You are constantly refining your practice, refining your ability to connect with and trust the people that you are working with and working for. So step one, awareness. Most of you are already here. That's great. 
If you didn't know, now you know. Um, as professionals, we want to do the most good. I think most people who go into a profession, who become a lawyer, become an accountant, become an audiologist, become a teacher, they do so because they want to do the most good, at least as one of their goals. Maybe they also find it personally fulfilling. Maybe they find the, uh, the challenge of something that they are interested in. So as people who want to do the most good, we should strive at a minimum to have an awareness of our client's needs. We're talking about what are their, um, what are their economic needs? What are their, um, we, we, they're obviously coming to you for their audiological needs, their, their, their treatment, their, their um, uh, interventions. Uh, and I apologize if I'm using the wrong language describing uh, how you um, deal with your clients, uh, the, the types of things you do for your clients, but largely uh, this is generalized language. So we need to at least be aware um, that when our, our, our young black student or our young black uh, client comes in, um, they're gonna have a much different cultural reaction to you and to the situation than you might expect from clients who are like yourself or clients, uh, if you are not white, um, you know that perhaps uh, we have to be aware of uh, how, to, how to act, how to behave, how to do the things um, that they want us uh, to, to have a, a comfortable interaction, right? Um, discovery. Did I put that on the wrong? Let me one moment. Yes, um, I, I put the arrow on the wrong spot. That's okay. Um, so you've begun making your own inquiries and investigations. You're aware of your clients' needs. You're aware of the, your community needs. Um, I think we tend to think of ourselves often when we go into a profession, we go off to college, all these things. We tend to think of ourselves as being now separate from the community, but that is not the case. You cannot think that way. We are part of the community. We are part of building. Our practice is part of building our society, everything that comes together with that. So you've begun making your own inquiries and investigations. So you're at, um, you're at the discovery. Uh, this is where you're at right now. This means connecting with members of the communities you seek to serve. Hey, I'm a member of your community. Um, if you are finding yourself in a space that doesn't allow for a lot of um, diverse voices, that means it's up to you. That's your responsibility to go out and discover these voices. Invite them to your talks, just like you did today, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, if you're having conferences, if you're having your meetings, you need, you need to reach out to these people. Um, and I know I'm a teacher and we all hate the homework, but you got to do your homework. You got to see where you're going to have the most impact. Examine areas for improvement, right? We, we are aware of our, our clients' needs. We have made larger discovery. We've gone through the discovery process, uh, finding our niche in a community um, and addressing community needs. Let's identify some more specific stuff. Ask the right questions. Hmm, I'm noticing a trend among my um, clients of Middle Eastern descent. I'm noticing a trend among my uh, immigrant population within my practice. What is happening with these populations that's different? So as scientists, as a science teacher, and as a scientist um, outside of the classroom as well, part of what I do is look for trends. Part of what you've been learning is looking for trends, identifying trends, and addressing them. And look for unexpected answers. It's very easy to get caught in the trap of, oh, this person's not going to come. Oh my gosh, this student is never going to turn anything in. Oof, this person, we've been working together for so long and they haven't seen any improvement. When you're asking the right questions, you start to see connections that you might not have seen before. Is the way you're communicating with this person not helpful to them? Is it difficult for them to understand? Intent. State your intent in clear terms. I cannot stress this enough. 
too often when I do these types of talks, when I do these types of seminars, or um, when I do these types of, uh, of presentations for my colleagues, they say, I want to improve engagement among my um, Afro-Latino students. Okay, what does that look like? What does that mean? Be intentional, state your intent in clear terms. Things to avoid, avoid goals that don't have collectible data. Um, which I know it means you'll be collecting a lot of data and um, analyzing it and avoid vague terms. Things like, oh, I want to improve outcomes. In what way are you improving those outcomes? Um, the smaller and more specific and actionable your goal is, the easier it will be for you to apply your discovery and your evaluation of the things you've learned. Implement. Hey. You've got a, you've you've gone through the steps. You're aware the uh, you have an awareness of the problem. You've uh, conducted some discovery. You've invited voices that you normally might not hear. You've evaluated the issue. Great. Implement. How are you going to implement your action plan? What are you going to measure? What are your outcomes? Um, it could be something as simple as a uh, as a text message questionnaire. A lot of families. Hey, if you're uh, if you're poor, if you grew up poor like I did, um, you know that your parents tell you don't pick up the phone, don't pick it up. It's probably because they owe somebody money, and that's okay. So, find ways to reach, to implement your plan in a way that works for the people you're working with, for those communities of color, for those people who maybe they don't want to pick up the phone. Um, maybe uh, if, if home visits are part of your practice, maybe visits in public spaces should be added. A lot of people, a lot of immigrant communities don't trust that on the door. And then reevaluate. OK, so what impact did you actually have? As you look through your data, you're going through it, oh my gosh, okay, I've done this, I implemented my action steps. Hey, suddenly this seems very similar to your practice, to your audiology practice, right? Um, it seems very similar to that. What impact did you actually have? Did you see, uh, did your action steps actually impact the communities you were targeting? Was there an outlier that you didn't consider? Did it negatively impact a community that you weren't expecting? You changed your practice uh, in one way? Um, and now you're seeing some negative impacts across other sectors or other uh, other communities. Uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. You're going to say the wrong thing. I probably said the wrong thing a few times already today. <clears throat> and that's okay. Don't be afraid to ask questions. It sometimes feels like uh, we, especially in, in uh, American culture and in white culture, it feels kind of prodding to ask someone. Um, a lot of questions, especially not re related to the to the reason for their visit, right? But if you don't ask questions, you're not going to be able to even achieve that discovery level. And don't be afraid to start over. Sometimes your action plan, it doesn't go the way you want. Scrap it, whoosh, toss it out the door. That's okay. It's going to happen. I have scrapped my action plans dozens of times at this point. Um, and it's a matter of finding the plan that works. It doesn't matter how many times you start over. What matters is that you're working. So let's brainstorm your client. Juan F. is an elementary school student. His parents, both immigrants, have missed the last few sessions. When you reach out to reschedule, they seem hesitant to reply. What is one thing you can do to get Juan back on his intervention plan?
Okay. So I'm starting to run out of time, and that's okay. I will just move very briskly. Um, so, um, as what the barriers are, are in regards to Juan getting some therapy, getting getting his therapy, getting back on his plan. Have someone his family trust talk to them. Really, really good from uh, Mr. Ms. Woodpecker. Um, have someone that find the contacts within that community to build that trust. They don't trust you. That's really what the issue is. They don't trust you yet. Find someone they do trust. Um, maybe do a wellness call. Um, that's something that we do here uh, at the school and we do at uh, various levels. Uh, a wellness check. Hey, this is just an email reminder about your um, scheduled uh, appointment next week. Also, how are you doing? Is there anything we can do to help? Um, ask the parents if they would like an interpreter. Um, thankfully, we have these wondrous devices in our in our pockets. They do a pretty wonderful job of interpreting. Um, I have to submit um, instructions and reach out to parents in about nine different languages this semester. Um, there are now apps that allow me to do that simultaneously. It's fantastic. We are living in the golden age of communication. Um, the app I'm speaking of is Talking Points. If you haven't used it before, I strongly recommend it to anyone who works with a client-facing profession. Um, <clears throat> ask if there's a way to make uh, coming to a session either, easier, uh, whether bi-weekly or maybe through teletherapy. Oh, thank goodness for teletherapy. Thank goodness for digital communication. Um, I would not have been able to make my three meetings today if not for telecommunication. <clears throat> and uh, maybe changing the schedule around. Maybe his parents aren't bringing him in for sessions because both of them are working at that time. Um, this is a big one from uh, Mr. Ms. Woodpecker. Let the parents know he won't be punished for missing sessions. There is a lot of fear, especially among immigrant communities that if they don't comply with the dominant culture, they will be punished. Um, let's see, from Tucan. Ser honestos con los padres y abriños. Algunas veces al compartir nuestras historias le ayudan a confiar con nosotros. Great. Um, if uh, you do not uh, speak Spanish, that's okay, you do not have to. Uh, Toucan is sharing, uh, to be honest with parents, share part of yourself, be part of that community, be part of their community. If you want them to trust you, they have to, you have to be able to trust them a little bit, give them a little bit, and you will find that it goes miles and miles, just a little bit of trust from, uh, uh, from your direction to them goes miles for so many of these communities. All right, um, let's get to the culturally sustaining part. Um, culturally sustaining practices, deficit approaches. We want to generally avoid these, but the goal is to eradicate home and community practices that replace um, and then replace them with quote unquote superior practices. This is the story of the immigrant, the story of, um, you know, dress right, talk right, um, all of these, all of these ways that we tell people that they're not part of our community and that they need to join our community, that they need to change themselves. We want to avoid these deficit approaches. That's a no. Um, to say that, um, oh, well, they don't appreciate oh, this, this culture. They don't appreciate, um, they don't appreciate the, these kinds of therapies. They don't appreciate these kinds of interventions. They don't appreciate these kind of practices. So let's, let's change that. Uh, no. Um, acknowledge that that's the case and don't treat it as a deficit. Ask them, how can I make this more important in your life? How can I make my practice more valuable to you? Um, <clears throat> we view, uh, especially within uh, American culture, we tend to view outside communities as bankrupt of value. We see uh, Middle Eastern communities as, as barbaric and uh, backwards. Uh, we see Asian people as unclean and uh, they bring disease to our shores, but that's not the case. That's not what happens. That's not true. And stopping these deficit approaches, the way that people talk and think about other cultures and other people is the first step, the first part 
to culturally sustaining practices. Um, different approaches, uh, differentiate approaches. We want to bridge dominant practices without concern for maintaining home or community practices. Hey, you've got to blend your practice with home and community practices, because if they're not doing their homework, they're not doing their intervention, they're not doing their treatment at home that they're supposed to in between sessions, you're tripling or quadrupling your work. View the home and community culture as equal to your own culture. Try to incorporate some of their values and teaching into your practice. Individualize that practice. And I know that's hard. I've got 277 students right now. Individualizing my practice for 277 people is tough. And it is more work. But I get so much more value out of that work. I get so much more value out of my practice. I get so much better every time that I'm able to find a way to reach out to just one more student, reach out to just one more client, reach out to just one more colleague. Asset-based approaches is the goal. Provide access to dominant strategies while sustaining home and community practices. We don't want them to change their lives at home. We want them to feel valued. We want them to feel like they are part of this treatment. They're, you're not a sage on a stage standing up there and telling them, hey, you've got to do this and this and this and this. And if you do all those things, you can be a part of the community at large. No, we're saying bring your home community to our community. Tell me how I can improve my practice. Tell me. This is a relationship. You have to build that trust and you can't build a relationship with someone if you're just talking at them. You can't do that. We want to look at those funds of, of knowledge. We want to look at those assets they have at home. Mom and dad can't make it to meetings. Hey, do you have an older sibling, maybe an older cousin? Is there someone else in the household that can help out with this? Parents feel embarrassed. They don't want, they don't want to feel like there's their, their child has a disability. They don't want to feel like their partner has a disability. They're embarrassed. Is there someone else uh, that can help out with this? This is a marathon, right? This is not a race. And now I'm talking fast because I'm running out of time. You can make an impact. You can improve your practice by considering culturally sustainable practices. You can improve your community. Not only are you building your personal practice, you're also uh, improving the community both uh, on the professional end of things, but also the home community, your cultural community. You can build these culturally sustaining relationships. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak um, with people outside of my profession and share what I've learned, share uh, some of the things that I like to help people with. If you have any questions, um, I'll take just the next minute or two to answer those. You can check those in the chat. Um, or you can find me at esmith86 at gmail.com if you have personal questions or if you have specific questions um, about a, a practice or idea that you might have. All right, thank you so much, Enrique. It was a great presentation. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, <clears throat> what are some cultural ad adaptations that I've had to make to fit in socially in my work environment? Oh boy. Um, so typically, and you see this in your on your end of things. Typically, you see, you call it code switching, right? Um, when I am with my where I feel most comfortable, so this is back in Miami, back in Puerto Rico, where I feel most comfortable. Uh, where I'm surrounded by people who are like me. I don't talk like this, okay? I talk like this, I sound like this with my friends, you know? And then, pero like, let me tell you something. And I talk, and then I don't know why, but the accent come back. And then, estoy hablando español así de momento, without, you know? So to fit in socially, to fit in with my, with other professionals in my, in my in-group, right? Um, I've had to change the way I speak, change my language um, so that I'm understood. Uh, tone down some of my mannerisms that might be seen as as overly um, as overly dramatic or overly actiony. Um, it does cause anxiety. Uh, it causes a lot of anxiety. Um, sometimes it's a matter of of being like, oh gosh, did I did I say that right? Am I? Oh my goodness, 
ay Dios mío, pero me, me va a pensar, porque if I said it like that, oh my goodness, maybe the reason they responded poorly to me is because I didn't say it just the right way, or maybe I didn't say it the way that they're used to, and now they don't, they don't understand what I'm trying to talk about. When really it's, it could just be a matter of miscommunication, right? Uh, of traditional miscommunication, in-group miscommunication. So yeah, that is, that is a source of anxiety for me. It's a source of anxiety for any person whose culture identifies outside of, um, outside of the mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream American culture. Of course. Um, all right, so it's about that time. Um, if you have any other questions or if you have specific questions, you're thinking, you know, I really want to incorporate more of this into my practice as I move forward, um, or um, I'm moving on into an internship or moving on into a residency of some sort, um, please reach out to me. Um, I am happy to help anyone build a better, more culturally sustainable practice. Um, thanks again for having me, guys, and you all have a great uh, end of year celebration. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great night. Thanks. Bye-bye now.